And it's undeniable. It's undeniable that when you see that, you know that the animal doesn't want to die. Yeah. It's un- you, you have to be... Honestly, man, it's like to think anything otherwise is delusional. Yeah. It's delusional. Yeah. For- All right, here we are, another episode of the Carb Strong Cast, and I'm here with an old friend of mine, Abdullah Zainab. Abdullah is a YouTuber, a weightlifter, amateur cyclist turned ultra endurance athlete, mm. inspirational speaker, all of those things. Good bloke. So we've got Abdullah here. The last time I seen you, Abdullah, was probably on my Light Up the World tour, I think. Mm-hmm. You were the guy behind the camera, putting in the hard work, holding that camera for <laughs> hours on end. How did how's life treating you now? No, it's been great, man. Since then, I mean, how long ago was that? That would have to have been that was November two thousand and eighteen. Mm. Yeah, it would just feel I don't know. Eh? It's yeah. been good. A lot. No happened. doubt, it's been good, but it just feels like we're here now. So <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about your your story. So, um, where are you from originally? Uh, born in Australia? Or? I'm born in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. And your parents? Um, one from Palestine, one from Jordan. Yeah, awesome, man. So you've uh, got a bit of culture behind you and stuff mm. like that. So what uh, always intrigues me about you, bro, is your mentality. And mm. I don't know where that comes from, but you've got this mentality to push through some pain barriers. Mm. But is there anything that happened in your childhood that gave you that sort of mental edge? Um, I don't know. I think surely there would have been something. I, I was training from a very young age, yeah. partially because I was just so insecure. Yeah. So that those years of insecurity and training... I developed the skills. I pushed so hard because I felt worthless. Yeah. So that's where I really developed the skills to be disciplined and all for the wrong reasons, but I still developed the skills to be able to push myself beyond what I thought was was capable. So then I just, it was more about de- taking those skills and then using them for different reasons. Yeah. That's it's like you overshot the mark maybe because you felt insecure. So then you started to push harder than mm. more people ever needed to, mm. to sort of feel satisfied or something like that. Yeah. Well, the problem is when you're like that, it's just you never really can get satisfied because yeah. you're not really treating the cause of the problem. Yeah, right. So it was good while it lasted, but eventually you just feel you still feel worthless, so you have to kind of work it out from there. Because it's almost like it's, it is something that's inside of you that you really can't scratch that itch because I've been on a few rides with you and mm. there's something about you, mate. You just, you've got some you've got an edge over everyone else and it's all mental it couldn't be like mm. let's just put it this way you're an amateur cyclist and you suck like, mm. the first time i met you you'd, you'd ridden your bike from melbourne to adelaide like it was not <laughs> yeah do you know what i don't know i think those formative years of struggling and trying very hard it just develops that endurance within yourself yeah you know so that was the invaluable skill when I came into endurance cycling because it was just like, oh, how can you? How do you keep going? And I was like, I've just kept going my whole life anyway. Mm. So, you know, if you have a problem, you keep going for years. It's the same concept. You're just yeah. applying it now physically in the cycling realm. Yep. So it felt very natural to me. Or yep. I'm thinking, like, I'll be thinking crazy stuff and I'll be like, oh, I've been thinking crazy stuff my whole life. Yep. I know the show just continues anyway. Yep. So I was, it was easy for me to push. I wouldn't get bogged down by the thoughts. It wasn't so much I was a physical superstar. It's just I'd get to that point that everyone gets to where it's like quit, you know, well, there's no point in doing this. And I'd be like, well, I've thought of quitting before yep. and I didn't quit. Mm. So I'll just continue anyway. Now I've met your mum. She's very supportive of everything you do. Is there anything to do with like your, your mother that's given you some, t- mm. uh, like she's given you a push when you were younger and maybe that's influenced you as you got older? Yeah, definitely. I mean, my mum's supportive and she believes yeah. in me. Yeah. So it's just nice having someone who believes in you that much yeah. because no one really like you people, you know, your friends believe in you and stuff and, mm. but they can't really see the vision that you see yeah. as clear as you see in your own mm. mind. But for me, the closest person to that is my mum. Yeah. So I can see it clearly. She can see it pretty clearly and she just helps keep me inspired and, yeah. and you know, reaffirms that what I think about myself already. Amazing. That's killer, bro. And um, you battled some depression when you were a bit younger as well. Yeah. How'd you get over that? How did I get it? Well, it was a long process. Yeah. I mean, I started training because I was in the standard state of like, I'm not good enough. Let me try and be good enough. Yeah. So I did all that training and fortunately, but unfortunately, in the sense, I achieved what I wanted to yeah. and then I still felt like shit. Yeah. So that kicked off the new cycle of like, okay, if I achieve what I set out to and still feel like shit, something must be wrong here. Yeah. So then that sparked off some internal pursuit yeah. where I was like, all right, how can I feel good again? And it was more so just changing my beliefs and perceptions about the world and getting getting to the root of it that way and trying to understand 
how I'm good enough without any of these things. Yeah. And trying to find a way to be happy and at peace long term without the external world. Which for that was like, like I feel pretty at peace now, but it's still an ongoing project. Yeah. That's a 10 year, just to get to that, it's a 10 year thing yeah. where I can have some sort of stability day in, day out where I'm like, oh, I'm starting to feel good overall long term. Mm. But it's a path, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, because you said you, you you battled with insomnia and you couldn't mm. sleep and you, you didn't know how you were going to get out of it for yeah. a while. Well, that was, yeah. See, that was invaluable for cycling long distances yeah. because it was like, now you're not going to sleep. It's like, well, I've done, I did five, five years like really hard, no, very minimal sleep. So, yeah. but that was good for me because it gave me so much extra time to yeah. reflect and think, which yeah. I didn't have before. And ultimately, my thinking led me to that point of dissatisfaction. My beliefs led me to that point of dissatisfaction. So I had to go back in there and try and re understand how I got to that point because inevitably I had a pretty good childhood. Yeah. Like I come from a, a family where the work, in terms of just like sheer life circumstance was done before me yep. in my mum's time and my mum's time. So it's yep. not like I'm born into sheer poverty or something, some abject poverty force on me, but still I felt dissatisfied. So I was very certain that I had led myself to that point yep. via yep. my thoughts and my beliefs. So that extra time at night gave me time to go back in there and try and re- try and re-understand how yep. I got there, which was great. So you you went through suffering before you actually put you through self through that physical suffering. You went through that mental yeah. suffering. Yeah, because that tr- the physical suffering, suffering or difficulty. I don't really call it. I don't feel like it's suffering because it's something I choose to do. Like yeah. the loss of a family member for no apparent cause, or yeah. you know, sickness, disease, death. That they're more sufferings now in my own mind, especially yeah. after doing cycling. That choice is just difficult to me. Difficult yeah. to me. But I still understood that no matter like. The overarching thing is that all of that difficulty takes place in your mind. It doesn't, yep. it's physically, it shows up, but it's all digested, interpreted, and perceived within your, your mm. mind. So having worked on that so much is that it helped me negate a lot of that physical pain yeah. and be able to push through. Let's talk about... Um, so you developed as an amateur cyclist, really. You just hopped on the bike. You're more of a weightlifter. Mm. You, know, you, you, were putting in, you were very disciplined for mm. many, many years. And I don't know, people understand that type of dedication... You never really missed a, a training session. Yeah. Like whether you'd have to get up at 3 a.m., mm. right? You'd do your weight training session, then you'd go on a mega ride, and then you'd be counting your steps. You'd be doing a ridiculous amount of steps through the city. <laughs> and, it, you know, then you'd eat your rice noodles and your tofu yeah, at yeah, night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, so you had this endurance mindset, mm. dedication, mm. discipline, through your weight training, into your cycling, and just into your normal life. Mm. Talk about that. Well, the, I don't really find it... To me, for me to sit here and say that it's like the same amount of energy I apply to it, it's not the same anymore. Because mm. now it's just habit. It's a force of habit. It's not yeah. hard for me to be disciplined. Because yeah. it's just like... It's like drinking or pissing or taking... A sh- it's routine. Yeah. So... But I still try and apply discipline in areas that aren't routine for me or aren't habit, just so I'm constantly working on it. Mm. But like I said, it was just habit for me, man. Yeah, and from just years. Initially, there's a few phases where you have to really work hard at it, but then it just becomes this like big snowball that just carries on. And then to carry that into cycling was just like it's so it's so easy. So you didn't really give yourself a choice. You're getting up at three a.m. and you're going to do your training no matter what. Yeah, I, yeah, because I don't know, man. There's just no option. Yeah, I mean, I know that if I want to do if I want to do something, then I'm willing to do what I need to do to do it. You know, and I know that nothing feels worse than wanting to do something and be it, being in such conflict with yourself that you can't measure up your actions to what you want to do. Like, you feel absolutely worthless. You feel yeah. like, you know, I want to go train. You don't go train. That only f- further increases your disbelief in yourself. Yeah. You know, that, that gap between wanting to do something and not having to do something to do it, you just become like, I'm, I'm not, I can't even help myself. So I made it my mission yeah. to make sure that they fully align all the time, that if I want to train, then I'm training. Yeah. If I don't want to train, I'm not going to go train. But I'm not going to say I want to train and then not go train. That's crazy. Because the pain for for not living up to your own standard is more than the pain of getting up at 3 a.m. and training. Yeah. Well, it's like being it's like the pain of being a hypocrite too. Like yeah. Knowing that there's knowing that you know the better option and you're not taking it is like it's like shackles on your head. Yeah. And no one burdens more from that than yourself. Anyone else doesn't burden as much as you. So that's a big lesson for those who are having self esteem problems because mm. they're not living up to what they believe they yeah. can. Well, at the same time, I used to think to me, what have I done to make my to have self esteem? Yeah. Do you know? Like it's something that comes along with action. Yeah. You know, you develop more self-esteem, more self-belief, more confidence, the more you actually do. Yeah. You know, it's nice to think or to have these beliefs and understandings that kind of give you self-confidence 
just by sheer nature of life itself, yeah. which is cool, but that's another story. But in terms of developing self-confidence, a big part of it is just like, do I say I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do? Do I actually do it? And just repeating that cycle day in, day out, day in, day out. And then you're just programming yourself to think like, yeah, I'm about what I say I'm about. Yeah. And that makes you just like pull your shoulders back. Like, yeah, yeah. feels good. Because no one I mean? really knows but you. Yeah. Hey, no one really no, knows yeah. what you're doing behind yeah. the scenes but you. But if you're failing yourself, you know that. And that's the hardest thing to that's, face. Yeah. And that's the hardest. That's the worst pain you can feel the burden of that. Yeah. So I want to talk about um, the India Pacific bike race. Mm. Now, we, there's a lot that went uh, before that. You mm. were a YouTuber. You, you're you know, putting a lot of your stuff online. You're an amazing uh, video, videographer, editor, very artistic. You brought something to YouTube that no one else was doing yeah. in the same way. Um, but you decided to get involved with the Indo-Pacific bike race and make this film. Um, let's talk about how that come about. And I want to talk about the journey that that film took you on and how it changed you. All right. So how the film came about was... I was slowly kind of not doing as much YouTube anymore because it wasn't feeling right personally. Mm. You know, I was having my own internal conflicts there. So I was kind of popping down on the YouTube a bit. But I had a friend who was doing YouTube who was doing the race. And he was like, hey, you know, there's this bike race across the country or whatever. And I was like, I, you know, like I've kind of done stuff like that before in my head. Not as long, but it piqued my interest. And mm. I thought, he was like, we should film. We were talking about how we could film a great documentary. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, I'd love to do that. And then he was like, how, do, how about we do it? And I was mm. like, all right, cool, we'll do it. So I took my girlfriend. We went and um, just started filming that race, which the duration was about two weeks. And it was much like an endurance event for us because we were in the car, sleeping in the car just for two weeks straight filming this thing. So it was a great joy. But a lot of stuff happened in that event Yeah, um, that set off my trajectory for a different path for the better, really. Yeah, something really full on happened on that yeah. event. And do you want to talk about um, Mike Hall and the relationship you built up with him mm. in that time? Because I think um, he was one of the leading racers and you were spending time filming each of the races and mm. probably more time filming the, those in front. And there was a bit of a battle going on with the person in the lead and Mike mm. Hall. And can you just explain what happened? So we were initially going to follow four riders. You know, two that were kind of mid-pack to mm. mid-pack, I would say mid-pack riders. Yeah. And then I was like, I want to follow the top two yeah. at least. So our method was, because it's across the country race mm. and these gaps open up to, you know, six, seven, a thousand kilometers between these two groups. I said, we'll follow the first two until they finish yeah. and then go back and follow the other two. So we were following the first two riders, this guy called Michael and Christoph Allegard. They're supposedly, when I came into the scene, well, I still consider them that they would be the best athletes in that genre of cycling. So we were following them and they were having this full-on battle and they were very close. At the time, I didn't realize how monumental it was, but they had never, ever ridden against each other. Okay. So for them, it was a very serious thing. That This is the first time the so-called two best were in the same country doing the same race. And how long is this race? So everyone that doesn't know, because a lot of my uh, following is yeah. not going to know what, it's how It's five big... and a half thousand kilometers. Wow. So What's no, that in miles? That's like... It's probably 3,000. 3,000 yeah, miles. Yeah. So it's no support, everything on unsupported yourself. Unsupported. Unsupported, no cycling, support, no yeah. drafting. You have to do everything yourself. Yeah. There's no clock. It's just first person to the other side on the given route wins. So they were going hard at it. And it was all coming to this culmination point a bit at the end. And then just randomly, it was actually, it kind of, that Christoph kind of established that he was going to win. Like I was like, okay, he's going to win now. He kind of, they came together, they met in the mountains after him being ahead for such a long period of time. And then he kind of like established the fact that he was in front and the other guy kind of dropped back a little bit. And it seemed like that's how it was going to play out. So I was in Wollongong doing a set of dumbbell press and then I remember the exact moment my friend called me and he's like, uh, Michael it just got hit by a car, he died. Oh my God. And I was just like, through these dumbbells, I was like, what are you talking? It was just one of those moments like you just least person you expect. Like, it was the last thing I was expecting. So he ended up getting hit by a car at like 4 a.m. in the morning in the way to Canberra. How long into the race was this? It was about 5,000 K in. So Canberra's probably like 450 K from Sydney, I think. So it was very close to the oh, end. Oh yeah, it was literally one day away from finishing. Wow. One day away. And the other guy was on his final day. So he's coming into Wollongong, which is a couple hundred K from Sydney, I think. Christoph was on this And they title. pull him over and they say, look, this other guy's died. Oh my God. You know, so that's how it kind of unfolded, which was, it was a tragic event, but it was, of course it was a tragic scenario to play out like that, but it was just, it was just crazy to be filming it and then this thing unfold. Yeah. And it, it was just crazy, man. I remember speaking to your mum at the time and she was very worried about you and um, 
once we talked to you and you know we just wanted to get your perspective on how you felt and mm. you know make sure everyone was okay but how mm. did you f- really feel in that I moment I felt gutted like, man I just felt it's not like I was best mates with the dude but right. just following someone for the, just not you know just being in contact with someone and then suddenly they die is mm. traumatic you know mm. like so that that was very hard for me because yeah. I just felt so like what just just took place yeah and it was just, I was so tired emotionally too from being yeah. on the road for two weeks and having to deal with all of that. Yeah. But if anything, it really inspired me to, you know, finish the film and try and do justice to it. It gave it a new perspective. Yeah. A new weight. Like, do you feel like there was a little bit more pressure on you to really make something of this yeah. film in, in dedication to mm. one of the writers who passed away? Yeah, it did feel like that. But it did feel like that. And it, it, seemed, per- it seemed perfect to me because I thought like, I'm the person to do this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I felt like I was the right person to be there filming it, have this whole scenario play out and then to carry the weight of that and to go out and deliver something that I believed in and I thought did the whole thing justice. Yeah. So yeah. it was perfect in my eyes. And I've watched the film. It was an amazing piece of work, mate, and something that you should be very proud of. And I think you did do him you know, justice mm. and his life justice. And now what people might not know is that was it the following year? The following year. The yeah. following year, <laughs> you took upon yourself to actually um, enter this insane race. Is it one of the hardest bike races on earth yeah. or is it up there? With- it's up there because I've done another one that I perceive, uh, I would say was harder, but at the same time... We'll talk I'm, about yeah. that. We'll talk about the one you did follow. You know that. what? I've talked to a lot of people and it's just like, what's hard? You know, yeah. Who defines, yeah. It's different for everyone. Yeah, ex- subjective. It's so know. subjective. It's subjective. You know? But for you, you hadn't done anything, I hadn't like, done that anything like that before. Mm. The, the closest thing you'd done is probably the the Melbourne to mm, Adelaide, Adelaide, correct? And yeah. you try to do that in two day, three days, yeah, yeah, or something yeah. like that, which is ha- which is hardcore. Yeah, yeah. But from going from that, mm. stepping up to like cycling across the stra- Australia's a large continent, mm. you know, that that's a very big step up. It's not like you gradually built <laughs> no, up to that. No, no. But but what prepared you for that was filming it. For sure, yeah. So maybe that you, you sort of knew what to expect. Yeah, well, I had a lot of reasons to do it. Well, first yeah. of all, the main reason to do it was that, that I just had a moment in the race where I thought to myself, I've got to try this. And then it's one of those fortunate situations where you have the thought and you're like, man, I can't escape now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you're like, do one more. And then, you know, I know what it feels like to want to do one more and not do it. Yeah. So I thought, shit, now I've had the thought, I've got to fulfill it. Yeah. So that was the initial. And then I thought, you know, I've, I've driven this whole thing. And, you know, I had, I knew every, and I got a really good taste of what the top guys were doing and how they acted, their demeanor, you know, just their overall personality traits, which I thought enabled them to be able to cover this distance. So I was fascinated by that. And I thought, I want to put myself in a situation like that and see who I am, what I'm like, and if I can do it. So that was originally the original inspiration. And then, so I filled out the paperwork and I was getting ready for, I probably trained like 12 weeks. At the time, I thought 12 weeks of training was a lot of training, you know? But so, these these ultra, let's just put, give some people some perspective. Mm. These ultra endurance cyclists have been doing this for their entire life as a like well a large part of their career mm. has been ultra endurance cycling. Their sure. focus. You're a weightlifter who just hops on a bike with his flip flops on and yeah. <laughs> rides up Norton Summit yeah. trying to get like PRs. Yeah. This wasn't your entire focus. This was just another hobby for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And that's I approached it like that too. Yeah. Because I was like, no, nah, I already lift weights. I don't need to be super disciplined with this. It was more so just about exploring the limits and what I could do mm. mentally. I wanted to test out. I wanted to see what I'm about mentally because mm. I had thought of all these like concepts yeah. and you know thought of myself as a little philosopher sitting in my mum's basement. But I was like, cool, let me see if I'm actually legit and if these actually work or otherwise it's just talk. So that was really why I wanted to do it also. So I just prepared for it. But the thing was that four weeks before the race, they I get a, end up getting an email from them saying that the race was cancelled. Yeah. Because the they were having a coroner's inquest about the death of Mike. Yeah. But there was still a bunch of people rocking up. And I was like, dude, even if no one rocked up, I still would have gone and done it myself. Yeah. So eventually we just pulled up to the start line in March and it began. So you went ahead with the race even though they officially cancelled it? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So you followed the exact race? Yeah. Well, the whole thing stands the same because official or not official, it's really the same thing. Yeah. It's just whether or not it's official in your own mind. Like, yeah. So, you know, but, still like 50 or 60 people rock up yep. to the to that. There's still the route. There's still the GPS. There's still, the, you know, the people watching. There's still the same rules apply. How, really, who knows if you follow it? It's on it's on personal thing, man. How many other vegans were cycling? At the time, 
Honestly, I forgot if there was any other vegans. Was there any? I don't know if there was any. You're other the vegans. only one eating a plant based diet throughout this yeah, race. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, so, I think so. I don't want to say that because I've said that before, and it turns out. To yeah, be well, they vegan. might. Well, they might have. Been, I'm just not sure. You're not sure. I'm not sure. Because if anyone's watching, yes, Abdullah, you're training with a plant-based diet. You've yeah. done weight training with a plant-based yeah. diet. You're not a small guy. You've done these ultra-endurance feats on, uh, feats on a plant-based yeah. diet. You eat a lot of noodles, a lot of carbs. Talk yeah. about what you eat generally. On that, on, Generally? On the race just, like that? Just generally and then... Generally, I, I eat pretty good, bro. Yeah. Like, I don't mind eating a bit of crap here and there. I don't even yeah. call it crap, but I mean like what people would consider crap. Yeah. But I like... I eat a lot of vegetables. Yeah. I eat a lot of vegetables. Yeah. Like literally, I can tell you what I had for dinner last night. Yeah. Like I had purple sweet potato for dinner last nice. night. I had those corn vegan fillets. Yeah. Nice. I had some gravy. Yeah. I had peas. Yeah. And then after that, I had some protein powder and some blueberries. Nice. And some coconut. I went nice. to bed, you know. And then before that, I'd probably just eat fruits and vegetables throughout the day and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So you eat, pretty ba- you eat a pretty balanced diet and you don't mm. restrict like, you don't, if you want a bit of oil here and there, you don't restrict that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But pre- predominantly, you're eating a lot of fiber. You, you yeah, know, very, yeah, yeah. yeah. But for a race like that, mm. you're going to throw out a lot of your eating traits mm. out the window, obviously, mm. but you're keeping it plant-based, you're mm. keeping it plant-based, but you're not, you're just trying to eat what you can to get the most amount of calories yeah. in on a race like that. Yeah, you just eat trash, really, you know, yeah. and sometimes, I'm not saying it's hard to do it as a vegan diet, but sometimes, you know, like, you're just going to have to eat bread and, and Skittles and Powerades and drinks, and that's yeah. fine, though. Hot chips, fried hot chips. Hot chips, all of that, too, because a lot of it, also, like, at the same time, you could you could argue and say, oh, it's, it's more convenient to not be plant-based but at the same time a large part of the mindset comes you would 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 the mindset wouldn't be the same if you weren't plant-based so you could argue saying that the amount the negative effects to your mindset would affect your overall performance more than getting a tiny bit more energy from a sausage roll and feeling bad about it you know what i'm saying you're saying that you had a little bit more of a what would you call it so like you had a bit of a disability on that Mm. uh, race because you had to pick you know the plant-based options in these like small service yeah but honestly it doesn't take honestly it's just like I said, it's a holistic approach. So you have to take care of your body. You have to take yeah. care of your mind. And yeah. they both require, you know, you both have to pay focus to both of those yeah. things. And so eating, obviously, pays attention to your body. It gives yeah. you the sustenance and too. But eating also, from, especially in a vegan sense, in an ethical sense, it has effects on your mind too. Yeah. So to just completely abandon that and to suffer the effects of that mentally yeah. would decrease your performance anyway. Decrease your performance more than spending, you know, 10 extra minutes going, what can I eat here? Yeah. That's not really so you don't want to break you don't want to breach your ethics and then have no. that guilt while you're on a crazy race. Because like, yeah. on a crazy race mm. like that, you're tired, you're exhausted. Mm. You're like, I need food. I'm mm. going to die here. <laughs> Give me some food. Yeah. But then to, on top of that, to go, I need something that's in line with my moral yeah. principles as yeah. well. I've been on many uh, rides with you and I remember just going through this, the service stations, going through these little like, you know, convenience stores, like where's the vegan cereal? Where's the soya milk? <laughs> yeah. Come on, give me that jam. Where's the bread? <laughs> like yeah. just trying to find something, yeah. looking at the back of packets, like where's yeah. the vegan stuff? Like, Well, mm. the more you ride, the more you know, kind of get around yeah. and you kind of know what to go to. I mean, I thought Australia, I didn't think Australia was hard to be vegan. Yeah. If anything, I've traveled to other events now and then been like, well, like this is this is a lot harder, but still, you just make the best choice you can, and a large part of it is just being in harmony. Yeah, you know, with yourself, with your ethics, with your body, with all of that. Yeah, and so that's the main priority. It's probably you. I would I would honestly think I would do better, like if I just felt mentally sound, than just having a tiny bit more energy. Yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? yeah, yeah. Just a bit more energy. You know, some people have the most energy. They're they're like in crazy great shape, have the most energy, but they can't. Some people just can't bring them out of themselves. Very, and that's just the mental component. Yeah. So, and huge. let's talk about the the Indo Pacific bike race and your performance in it. So, mm. you come off really fast, dude. Like yeah. you just went for it. I've mm. seen you were bridging your gap. Like no, no, you you increased the gap really. Mm. So, like I was like, he's gone too fast, too soon. But yeah. you really did hold that gap for mm. a long time. How? Well, at the like, so I had the introduction from the races before. Yeah, and I thought to myself the year before, and I thought to myself, I don't, I don't know what my limit is, and I knew that if I tried to think I knew what my limit was, I would, you know, kind of sabotage myself by underpinning it to what it could be. Yeah. So I just kind of went in there knowing that I could probably bring the best out. I can bring the best out of myself, but I just went, okay, this is what I think I can do. And then I'm just going to add 30% on top of it, which was kind of roughly what the guys the year before did. So I just copied them, which was a hard gap mentally to believe yourself in because it's like saying, okay, you're new to this sport. I'm going to copy what the best in the world do. And now you have to believe in yourself that you can do that. So I was like, who gives a, like, I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just like, rid, or just, I just believed in that and just thought, if I can just stick to that plan, I'll be able to do it. And that's what it was. How much were you sleeping on that? 
race. I was probably sleeping. I slept quite a bit now, reflecting. Maybe four hours, three hours. You know, which is, but you'd go maybe 20 hours, 22 hours. Sometimes you'd have to go 27 hours, sleep three, depends. four hours. Depends on the weather. And then you continue again, you continue again, you continue again. You just repeat that cycle. And where were you sleeping? I would plan it to sleep in hotels, like motels and stuff. Smart. Just so I can get a proper rest, have a shower. You know, kind of re-normalize yourself, you know, watch a bit of TV, you know, talk on the phone, charge yeah. stuff. Stuff like that. I like it like that. But inevitably, you get to a point where the gaps between these motels are so far that you have to kind of start napping. Yeah. Because you just can't. You can't stay after 10 days of being awake, you know, 20, 22 hours at a time. You can't do that anymore. Yeah. So you've got to pull over on the side of the road, just have a 20 minute nap wherever you can and just continue and keep going. That's when it starts to get fun though, when you, when you start to feel like, you know, like a wild animal just pulling up, sleeping. You're on the side. used to being in uncomfortable situations. <laughs> yeah. so like, and you, you, so you do have that edge. Like when, you, when you're cycling, sometimes you don't even wear cycling gear, you just wear whatever, mm. like, you know, so, you, you know, some crappy old helmet that's flopping off your head, <laughs> like riding a, a single speed up a hill, like you're in, uh, you're putting yourself in uncomfortable situations anyway. Mm. So to put yourself sleeping on the floor for a little while, you don't really, you got that mental edge over someone who's yeah. never put themselves in that uh, yeah. discomfort. Well, also, honestly, that's probably the most comfortable, the floor becomes very comfortable. Once you've been out there for, uh, <laughs> honestly, man, once you've been out there for 10 days and stuff and you're like barely with your eyes open sleeping on the floor is like a, it's like a king mattress you don't know yeah and then you just hop up and you're just like oh let's get it like just jump it's so exhilarating you feel so i think that's the biggest draw man you feel so alive and you feel so connected to something bigger than yourself and it becomes really like that and that's what's so fat, fun for it so you're having like a spiritual uh, oh, yeah. evolution out there like oh, an experience yeah. well you've got to think about it think about all the most you know times of revelation and personal, you know, development that you've had, a lot of the times they come from just silence and time removed from your, you know, your normal environment. This is like saying, okay, you might spend 200 hours a year by yourself or something. This is like, we're going to spend 350 hours in like two and a half weeks. We're going to do 350 hours and we're going to do it in two and a half weeks. In one strap block. In. Yeah. Strap in. You're not yeah. going to talk. And you're suffering because a lot of uh, spiritual growth comes out of suffering. Yeah. How, to, how, to, how to deal with suffering and yeah. mental tricks to deal with suffering and get, being away from the pain, like focusing away from the physical. And that's all what meditation is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You really, just, the only way for you to physically do, do a race like that is, is just to be 100% present. Yep. You know, and you can get away with that for a long time. Not get away with that, but that can carry you through. Having lots of focus and being able to be present can carry you through a long time. Yeah. But eventually you reach the journey kind of asks for it you reach these points where it's like alright and you have these moments where you have to go through something think about something it's like a threshold when you cross by and it's like alright we're going to teach you a lesson now you learn it and then you move on and if you can't if you can't if you can't get over that then you can't continue so yeah. there's like these doors you unlock to continue and continue and you have to just be really, really ready to just die in a way yeah. and let go of everything that you think you know about yourself and then just keep can keep continuing so that's yeah. really that's really the funnest bit for me because I get a lot of personal gain out of it. Yeah. It's not that I enjoy it. It's not that I'm like, oh my God, yeah, let me run across the country. It's going to be the best thing. I just know how much of a transformation it can be. On the and then other you come side. back to normal life. You're just like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> well, the, your film is actually called Journey to the Other Side. And it's yeah. like, that's like, you know, philosophically could yeah. mean the other side of Australia or the other side of yourself. Yeah. And it, even for Mike, it was yeah, the other side. Yeah. He passed away, didn't he? Yeah. So, well, that was really what I meant by the title. You know, the other yeah. side in all realms, the country, spiritually, and just in life in general, journey to the other side. Really and the incredible. transformation yeah. that you go through just doing it, you know. I don't. I just want to make sure we cover this, but you actually finished first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you finished first in a ridiculous, with a ridiculous, like, lead. Yeah. Your first time you, you, you rode this, yeah. this race, which so, is crazy, mm. man. That is cr We were all like cheering you on <laughs> i was like oh my god like i was sending you i remember sending you a message but if you i was actually on tour doing my first uh i remember getting vegan that message. prophecy tour yeah. so i was going through my own struggles and mm. doing my own endurance type thing for the animals and the activism mm. but i had tears in my eyes man like go abdul like yeah. I, I really felt it man i was mm. like dude he's really he's really making like like a history here within yeah. himself like yeah. this is crazy man it felt like that man and yeah. especially the comments i remember that day you messaged me i was in warnable Yep. I just remember crying. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. who cries when they get a message? Do you <laughs> know? But when you're thing. in a state like that, you're so receptive emotionally yeah. Yeah. that dudes will send you a message and it's like, whoa. Yeah. Like, I'm about to go tear this day up. Yeah. You know, like, I'm ready. Yeah. You know, which is so, I think that's so cool to be so, to feel emotions and for them to be genuine, yeah. you know, not to just have to kind of force it or think like, yeah, 
I should be grateful. It's like to feel great. It's weird to be out there after like 100 hours, be in the middle of nowhere and be grateful yeah. and just think, fuck, this is amazing. Like, yeah. why? You start saying things like, why me? It's like, when do you normally say that? What was your feelings cross, crossing that finish line? Mm. And you had your family there at the mm. end and how did you feel? I don't really, honestly, I don't really feel anything when I cross the finish line because it's just the finish line. Like I was relieved, physically I was relieved because I was just a mess. I had, no, I, I had nothing left when I pulled up. So I was just like, I was dead. Especially once you, it gets worse once the race is over anyway. But I knew that the end was never, I was never focusing on the end. Do you know what I mean? Because I just knew that it's just, it's just false. It's if anything, it signifies the end of the journey. There's no more journey, especially that journey that takes place, which is the whole point. So I knew all the moments in between those two weeks were what I was after. So it was cool, man. But it wasn't like, oh my god, I've been thinking about this moment. I can see it now. Like, oh my, god. like now I'm going to finally allow myself to enjoy it now that it's over. I knew that it was. I knew that it was always going to be over, and my only point was to enjoy it while it was happening. Because inevitably, the finish comes once you start. So I think that's what helped me. So, and it helped me after too, because it wasn't, I didn't suffer the emotional curve that most people suffer when it's like big event, peak, finish, and then boom, down to nothing. And you're just like, who am I? Yeah. And I guess focusing on the finish line when you're halfway through is not a good idea, is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because no, it's so far away. It's so far away. And you can, you know, anyone can really go through the, the thought process of that and you just start peeling it back. Like, okay, I'm 500 k and I've got four and a half thousand K. You start doing the math. You think oh, that's going to have the 200 hours. Like, what am I going to do? Oh my God. I'm and that's very, you don't, number one, you're not even, there, you're not really taking in what's happening to you currently. Do you know what I mean? And you're just trapped in this future that doesn't even, it's not even a thing. And it's very energy taxing. And that becomes a problem when you start losing that much energy to thought. It, you just can't ride anymore, man. Yep, yep. You don't want to have to waste that kind of energy. How did your mum feel to have you back home? She was happy, she was happy man. But she yeah. was, I think she was, she was stressing like, oh my God, dudes are dying. Which was cool because like, as a, as a kid, you don't, think, you, don't, you don't think it's a big deal. But I can only imagine as a parent having someone die in a race and then your son being like, yeah, he died, I'm gone for it. And she knows what you're like. She knows how you push yourself and yeah. you, you don't, take no for an answer yeah, yeah. you don't give up yeah. so you push you you'd rather die than give up yeah. so your mum knows that yeah. about you well so. I won't tell anyone that yeah, yeah. You know, I think if I told people what I'm willing to do in that like it would scare them so yeah, yeah, yeah. but she knows she yeah, knows, she knows what you're so like. she's kind of like shit he's going to do it anyway no matter what I say let me try and let me try and damage control what could possibly happen yeah. like try and be like alright do this be make safe. sure you like, call yeah. me do this you know like make sure you sleep and do this and well, you surprised everyone. You surprised everyone in the cycling community. You surprised everyone in the... Well, I wouldn't say it was that much of it. We know what you, you can do, mm. but it was just... It's just an amazing feat. And you won by so far that we're just... Wow. But maybe people might have thought this was just a one-off thing. Mm. But then you decided to do something <laughs> even bigger. Yeah. Not Was it the, the following year? Yeah. So the following year... Uh, following year, I went to America to do what they call the Trans-America Bike Race, which is... It's about it's six thousand eight hundred k's, roughly. I just say roughly because it makes me feel better because I know it's more when you're doing it. But it's it's about four thousand two hundred miles, and, wow. and almost triple the elevation. So it's about sixty thousand meters. So what's up. elevation? So elevation, elevation is the amount of meters you go up vertically. So climbing on a bike, and that makes it twice as hard. Yeah, yeah. So Australia times. was like twenty or five or twenty seven. America is like sixty sixty to seventy. Thousand up, it's like seven, eight times up on Everest almost. So climbing up a hill, it makes one kilometer feel like a hundred kilometers. Yeah, well, you're, just for the sheer gravity, it yeah. makes your speed a lot slower. And I'm quite a lot bigger than someone who would be considered to be good at that. Yeah. But it was just more of a challenge for me, which I was excited to, I was excited to get into it. Yeah, yeah. So talk about the lead up to that. The lead up to that is a year before. I thought to myself, okay, I kind of want to, that one I did 12 weeks and I knew that 12 weeks is, you can't consider 12 weeks training, uh. you know? So I was like, cool, I've done 12 weeks. Let me see now if I can apply myself um, for a year. So the hard approach for me wasn't just smashing the hammer on the nail. It was like, let me see if I can be consistent, moderate, build up to this thing slowly over a year, yeah. which was nice because I allowed myself so much time. Yeah. I could relax more. I could, you know, think about it more. So I prepared myself physically. I, pre I prepared myself mentally for it, just with all the techniques I had learned from the last race and the experience of that. And then rocked up to that start line and brought it all with me. Yeah. Which was cool. Yeah. And how many people uh, were in this race? How many people entered this race? I think 100 plus. 100. Yeah. 100. And a lot of pro cyclists or a lot of... Ex-pro pro cyclists. Really fit dudes. Ultra yeah. endurance athletes. Yeah, yeah, dudes who you think are 
really good and have done a lot of experience. And, and did you did you find yourself feeling like a little bit out of place there? Or do yeah. I belong here? Or yeah, well, I did before. It comes to a, like you know, you, like I said in the race, you come to these points like you do one week to get to this one point, and then you have the breakthrough. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Much like life in general. So before the training, I had all my little breakthroughs. You know, you do six months, get to one month, you learn, the, you have a breakthrough, you get one lesson. You go through another three months, one month, you get the lesson, you keep going. So the build up to the actual event, like the last couple of weeks, it was the same thing. And it was more like self-doubt was coming to a peak. And I just remember coming out the shower the night before, just like, I remember, dude, because Andrew Ruiz Jr., that boxer, just yeah. beat and, and Anthony Joshua. A big upset. The night before, and I was inspired off it. Because I had started feeling self-doubt because I'm looking around and looking at these guys and I'm thinking, fuck, this guy's an ex-pro cyclist. He's, he's rode in you know, the Giro yep. d'Italia, this guy. And, but then I saw him win and I was, it was like a synchronicity to it's me. It's like an underdog. It was like, and I was just like, that's fucking me. Yeah. You know what I mean? The underdog. I was like, that's me. But it was cool because in that moment, I remember the night before, all I really wanted, man, like I, I started G'ing myself up. You know, I started going through my own my own, you know, frameworks of thought that would reestablish to me that I was the best ultra endurance cyclist on the planet. Yeah. So I'm going through all those thoughts in my head, like, you know, kind of not brainwashing, but just explaining to myself why you are the best. Yeah. Um, and I was doing that. And then in combination with him winning, inspiring me, I just remember going to bed, like praying for the opportunity for me to take responsibility of this vision I had of myself. So I was just saying, like, put me in the situation and I'll show you what I'm going to do. Yeah. So that's what I was waiting for. And I got lots of those situations. But, but just being conscious of that, you're in those situations and you're like, this is the, this is the fuck, this is the moment. Yeah. Like, I'm about to take responsibility for myself here and go next level. And that was really cool. Yeah. So, so I just did this. I just had the same, you know, but, but it gets to a point where you actually care too much. And that's not really a good way to ride. So you have to really ride like you're ready for it to be over any second. Because that's really the truth of the situation. It can end any moment. Yeah. And if you if and if you get scared, because you're gonna lose, then you become hesitant. And then once you become hesitant, it becomes a downward spiral. Yeah. The only thing you really have to lose is not giving your best effort. Yeah. So I had to come to terms with it. I was like, I'm ready to lose. Then once I was ready to lose, I was ready to put it all on the line. Then you didn't and then have once I was lose, put on really? the line, I yeah. had nothing to lose. Yeah. So then once I was ready to put it all on the line, then I'm just riding as if it's about to end any second. I'm not riding like, oh, okay, I've got 10 more days. I'm just riding like, okay, if I make it to the next pedal stroke, cool, I'll do that pedal stroke. And that, and that, that produces a really harsh pace yeah. beyond logic. So you'll be with guys who are super fit and they'll be looking at you and they're logically trying to process your approach. But it's like, you've gone beyond logic here, you know, and you're just like riding on the limit as if, you know, it's going to end in two minutes. <laughs> which is so, which is so cool, so and that, you're hammering that set, yeah. you're hammering that mindset into your mind, like it's going to be over. It's like I'm putting on the line, I'm putting on the line, I'm putting on the line, I'm putting on the line all the time, and you just fly away, man. I mean, that's easy to say at the start, but how do you hold that for? Like, how long? How long is this? <laughs> like, how long is this race supposed to be? Yeah. Like, how long do people give themselves? It depends, sensibly? man. So I think competitively, it goes from the record time up to like twenty, twenty-one days. Yes. You know, even when you start, when you start going up to those days that time you're still doing 350 360 all the way up to 420 425 kilometers a day at the really the top the top end so that for anyone who's 400 cycles, kilometers a day is about 16 hours on the bike yeah with 16 hours on the bike if you're having a good day and but rest. when you combine that you're going up five six seven thousand almost um, out mount everest up hills you know and you're doing that day in day out it becomes different so that's probably a really anyone you know 21 20 honestly if you just cross that country now knowing how difficult that is it's all impressive to me but that's what it's like Holding the pace is a different, you know. Yeah. You've got to bring everything to be able to hold the pace. Mate. And it's not just holding that pace for that one day because like a lot of these rides are like the biggest rides anyone would do just in their entire career just mm. on one day. But then mm. you have to do that again the next day. Mm. And a lot of people can't even sit at the office desk for 16 hours, but you're sitting on a bike going up a hill mm. in all different types of weather and nighttime and, mm. you know, battling yourself and trying mm. to eat enough and drink enough and all of this. So uh, mm. like, and to do that consistently, I don't know if, if anyone hasn't done anything similar, mm. um, it's pretty hard to wrap your head around yeah. what that takes. Well, honestly, it's for me, you know, there's lots of levels to it. There's, you know, the previous experience, which you bring to that experience. Yeah. And that's much like saying that you've been training for this podcast your whole life. You know, you really bring all the experiences that you've had before into your current experience. Yeah. And probably that's probably the right way to do it. Is yeah. to learn from everything and bring it with you. So I had done that previously. And doing that, you learn things just about the nature of writing. Yeah. And like I said, with the nature of writing, as soon as you start, 
as soon as you begin, it ultimately it signifies the finish. So you know that it's going to be over once you start. And that really liberates any kind of like, you know, anxiety or thoughts about it. Because it's like saying the, as soon as you're born, you know you're going to die. Yeah. As soon as you start the ride, you know it's going to finish as long as you continue. So I knew I was going to continue. I ultimately knew it was going to end. So you embrace the moment like that. Um, and a large part of it is just starting. So I learned to my first race that if you just put the shoes on and get out the door, it works itself out. Yeah. And that's a quick way to realize that it always ends. You just have to give yourself the opportunity to realize it. So for me, it's just, if you can just do one thing, follow it through the whole way, you give yourself that opportunity to realize that once you start, it ends. Cool. And yeah. then once you do that enough, you go, okay, I'm sick of enjoying it only once it finishes. Let me try and enjoy it and make use of it while it's happening. So that's what you do. Yeah. And then you couple that with the awareness of human beings and their innate ability just to endure. That's the only reason why we're all sitting here. Survivors. Is, we, is we're survivors. That's what we do and we're the best at it. We're, one, yeah. you know, we're good at it, very good at it. And you have that within yourself. Couple that with the fact that, you know, even crazy stuff, like you can, you know, that, you know, millions of sperm make the journey, one makes it. Yeah. And all sperm's not the same. It's like, I, you know, it's not saying that if a different sperm made it, it would be you, it would be different. So you're the sperm that made it, combined with all the skills, and then you put that piece together and it becomes easy to keep going. You have yeah. more reasons to keep going than you have not to keep going. So it's just about coming to all those, coming, putting all those things together and then putting them through. Even like emotional detachment and just working on yourself. Like, you know, the more times you just want to quit and keep going, you realize I can want to quit and keep going. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So you wanted to quit and then you went, got past that. Yeah. So the next time you want to quit, I've already, yeah, know, I can get. Well, I want to yell. I don't yell. Yeah. You know, you're like, whoa. So I can feel something and do something completely different. That's pretty cool. Control. You learn control. And training in a really simplistic sense will give you that because you, because your body doesn't want anything more than it wants to survive. So yeah. when you get your heart rate up to 180, it's like, yo, stop this. So just doing that, and you can be from the most rich family with nothing and have no reasons out there for you to learn this type of stuff. But if you just go for a jog and get your heart rate up, you learn how to be in control of yourself. Yeah. That's what's so great about training, especially if you're not brought up in a hard circumstance where life will teach you that anyway. Yeah. Um, and then that's really the main thing. And then just and then just focusing on doing your best job with what you got. Yeah. And then you practice that, brushing your teeth, trying your back, all that kind of stuff. Let's talk about the actual race, mm. the Trans Am race. Um, did you hit the lead straight away again? Yeah. Did you take the same, take well, the same I'll approach? You, I'll give you an example. About 1,000 kilometers into the first one, yeah. um, I saw this guy called Stefan. Yeah. That was the last time I saw him for the whole bike race. Yeah. I remember I was going out to the longest straight in the world. Yeah. I turned around and saw him. I never saw him again. Yeah. So I had 4,000 k's left, not sending anyone from the race. This time, the last time I saw the nearest guy uh, was in a gas station 6, 000, with 6,500 k's left. Last guy I'd see from the race. So you, you you hit the lead after 500 k's, or after no, three, after 350 yeah. k's, it was me and, and this, you didn't me see and this dude going back and forth. But I kind of knew it was. It, I don't want to sound like a mean guy, but I already knew, I knew in my heart like it was going to unfold perfectly. Yeah. And when I saw the way everyone else was approaching it, I thought this is not what it's about. So he probably dropped off thinking he might, I don't know, but he might've thought, well, I can't hold this pace for the whole time. I'm going to have to drop off and then catch back up maybe mm. or something like that. Yeah, well, they think, okay, I can't hold this pace. Therefore, that guy can't hold the pace. So let me chill for a bit. And he's going to burn himself out. Yeah, he's going to burn himself out. <laughs> you know, he's going to, it's too quick. Um, but all, on, honestly, that one second of lapse in, in, in terms of just, you know, your thoughts or not, that just that one thought, giving yourself that one thought and believing it for one second, it's like, in one night, it becomes 70 Ks. In two nights, it's 250 Ks. By the end, it's 1,000 Ks. Yeah. Just from people believing that, you know, having that belief about you and then allowing themselves to believe it, affecting their possibilities, and then the gap just gets bigger and bigger, bigger. and bigger and bigger. And then eventually they submit to it and say, I can't close that, man. That's crazy. So you held the lead for how many days? So the whole 16, time? 16, 16 days. 16 days. days. From the lead, yeah. And you finished... <laughs> first mm. with a massive gap mm. and what happened what, what time did you get what was your I did, time i did about 16 days and i think it was like nine hours and just call it 16 days 10 hours flat okay yes. and what was the time before what was the, what's the, lead, the record the, the record on a two-wheeled bike is 16 days i think 23 hours and almost 16 days 24 hours so you you broke the record yeah you broke the so you have the world record on that yeah i guess on that right. world record yeah it's the record on that race it's a record on and how long has that race been running for Quite a while, man. Six some plus years, I think. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's so a lot of people. A, amazing that. feat. Yeah. That's an amazing feat. It was cool. So you bet you beat the previous 
time by yeah. half a day. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I had a lot of respect for that dude because honestly, my plan was to come in a day quicker. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, things happen. Yeah. But that's, honestly, that's the quickest you can do it anyway. What you do it in is what you do it in. But I just remember getting there feeling like, oh my God, man. Imagine what that guy had to go through to do that time. Like that, respect. Uh, so much respect, man. Because, uh, even if all the stars align, which it's so hard just to do that, man. That's to, to go day in, day out, day in, day out, day in. With all the adversity that comes up, no doubt. It's just like, it's so hard. Eh? So the first time wasn't a fluke. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, I, wanted, I wanted to cement that to myself even yeah. too. You know, because I knew the rule, yeah. I knew all these things. Australia wasn't a fluke. Yeah. You you have that in you and then you proved it again that you have mm, it in you mm. on a bigger, tougher race mm. with more hills mm. and you broke the, the record on that that, mm. that, that, that trail. And that's crazy, man. So you've basically got something inside of you that you you, you can nurture and you, you, you've basically like a... Something in your life has made you perfect mm. for ultra endurance uh, races. Yeah. Well, I, honestly, I was fortunate yeah. to be... Because I think that's that ability to endure is innate in everyone. But at the same time, you can't dis... You know, sometimes, you know, like, why do you do what you do, man? A lot of times, it's just environment. Yeah. Like, why does someone become a good AFL player? Well, someone said, let's go play AFL. Some people don't get that opportunity, you know, and they never realize that they have that in them. So I was always put in situations where I had to endure, yeah. at least physically and mentally, you know. You know, whether it be at work, on the bike, not sleeping. So all these circumstances in my life presented themselves as opportunity yeah. for me to learn that skill, which was cool. So, you know, I don't ever disregard that. Like it's lucky and it's well, however you want to say it, lucky or divine, whatever it is. Yeah. It's cool how I've always just been doing that and been given the opportunity to learn that. But I think it's not just, I think it's everyone. I don't think I'm special beyond anyone. I think the only thing that's special about what I've done is the fact that I've recognized it and then, like you said, nurtured it and just continued to develop that and yep. become aware of it. So how many other plant-based athletes were doing that race? Do you know? Well, the girl who actually won out of the girls was, was vegan. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's so, why I so said- two vegans? Yeah, I didn't, want to say, I didn't want to say, like, I don't know. I, that's why I said I don't know who was vegan in the first one. Because at the end, she messaged me saying, I'm vegan. So I remember saying to someone, like, no, nah, I don't think there was. And she was like, nah. She messaged me after saying that. I'm so vegan. the male winner and the female winner mm, were both mm, vegans. Mm. Wow, that's great. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. That needs a bigger platform to speak about because mm. a lot of you know the things I get from people like you, you know you've been eating a plant based mm. diet for a few years now. Mm, like, come mm. on, it's been half yeah. a decade. Well, I was in it and then I came out of it and then I came back, I'm back in into it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But predominantly, you've been eating a vegan diet. Yeah. You've been living vegan. So that for especially like if let's just say you weren't vegan and then you went vegan just for this endurance race. Mm. That proves it anyway. Like, mm. come on, 16 days just eating nothing but plant-based food. It just proves that, you know, mm. what, what, what do you think people, what, what is this misconception about having to have meat to recover and, you know, ha eggs to recover and or you have just, to have cheese and dairy to recover? Like, it's just conditioning. Man. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's conditioning and it's hard to let go of these beliefs that have just been so firmly ingrained into your yeah. mind from such a young age. You know, it takes, it takes, it's, it, I honestly got respect for anyone who's willing to go in there and yeah. then just be like, I'm willing to give that up for yeah. the, for the greater part of myself, yeah. you know, and the greater part and the greater connection to humanity. So I think that's why it's hard to separate, separate, step away from, but personally from speaking from my own experience, from going on it and then coming off it and then going back on it yeah. is like, I think, you know, the way I can only speak for myself, but the way I did come off it is probably just lack of edu lack of education for myself uh, yeah. in, my, in terms of my own understanding about it. And being wrapped up in coming from a really physical standpoint yeah. about, oh, this is just a diet. Yeah. And it's kind of like saying, oh, you're Buddhist because you eat vegetarian. Do you know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you're Muslim because you, you, you pray, but you don't yeah. do everything else. Yeah. That's kind of how I felt. That's what I was. I was like, yeah. And that's why it was so easy for me to give up because I was looking at it from a, a physical standpoint. And I knew just from training that I could do all sorts of stuff to my physique yeah. and, and be healthy. Yeah. Because I thought healthy was just a purely physical thing. And I approach it from a diet. So yeah. it's very easy for me just to swap out. And I think that's why it's easy for people not to take to it. Yeah. You know, because they see it as such a diet. Honestly, if it wasn't for you being, you know, another cool thing about the environment is that I had you there yeah. to kind of re re remind me in a kindful, compassionate, non judgmental way, say that that's not what it's about, man. And then I had already been. Just with my own work, like I knew that morals and ethics and your mind, that's all life was to me. And I really wanted to sharpen that and be, I didn't want anything more than just to be a good human. So appealing to that nature of it, I was like, 
You're yeah. like, no, nah, I can't live. And that, like we said, that gap between what you say you are and what you do, once that gets big, man, it's yeah. like the chains on your neck get heavier. And just living with that, you're like looking over your shoulder, like, mm. you know, but really you're watching yourself and it just becomes too much. You have no option. <laughs> yeah. I think once I explained it to you, like veganism, not being a plant-based diet, that's good for, for performance. And mm. I started saying, it's about justice, man. It's about, it's unfair to subjugate mm. and kill animals yeah. when you can easily reach for something else. And then you started understanding it from the philosophical point of view, mm. which is what veganism is. It's mm. like being anti-racism or something yeah. like that. And you're like, wow, that makes some more sense to me now. And then, yeah. you know, you're more motivated by that mm. uh, ethical belief. And now you've got your conscience uh, to sort of motivate you to make the right choices mm. when you're on these big rides. And yeah, that was epic. And also um, coming out with me and filming <laughs> for my oh, Light Up the World tour. Too, yeah. yeah, so like you're behind the camera for mm. everything I did on that tour. And that was one of the most challenging tours I've ever, you know, been on really. Mm. And you were behind the camera and, you're an ultra endurance athlete and how, how we, we were both really, we got sick in the first week. Remember yeah, we both yeah, got a flu. How was that for you? Talk about your experiences. Well, it was good. It, it, you know, it was great training. Just yeah. like, just being out there training in terms of a lot of things. Training is in trying to keep up my physical training. Yeah. Lifting, trying to ride at the same time, being up for 24 hours going. It was training in terms of just emotionally, just because even the best of us, if you put someone that close to someone for two weeks, in such an emotionally charged training situation, you're going to have to learn how to control yourself because yeah. you can't just you can't let yourself off the hook like that. Yeah, yeah. Especially when there's someone on the other end of those emotions. So I was good for that. And then in terms of just my my understanding of veganism yeah. to be so close to it was also enlightening. Yeah. You know, because it's different. You know, I went from hearing about it to you know my own personal beliefs and, and aligning them, and then to see it is like it's a different story. It's different yeah. when you're sitting at your home and you're doing this by yourself, and when you're out there close to it um it leaves an impact on you man yeah like in a in a really profound way that even now i still can feel it if i went back and revisited those memories you can still feel the same feeling yeah which doesn't really leave you yeah because you were bearing witness a lot and that that was yeah. the first time you'd been to a slaughterhouse to see mm. animals go in and uh yeah. remember the pigs in italy mm. uh that that experience oh, yeah, as well man. and like you were like, God, like they're in their own shit and they're suffering and you're connecting with the animals and mm. talk about bearing witness what that did to you. Well, you haven't, you know, when you, I think once when you're in that kind of bear witnessing situation, it's like there's a part of you that's connected to that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so there's a communication there. I don't know what it is, you yeah. know, like, but there is a communication there between animal and human. Yeah. Um, and that once it, once it communicates that in that, at that level, that bit inside of you, once it's it wakes up and you can't switch that off. Yeah. You know, so I think that's why it's so powerful. Yeah. It becomes very real. Yeah. And that's when it's like it becomes very it becomes a very serious reality. reality you yeah. know, and it and you can feel it. And it's once you start feeling like that, it's like, whoa. Yep. You know, the kind of stuff that makes like the air in the room feel like it's got sucked out of you. Yeah. You know, and stuff like that can bring you to tears and, and trigger you emotionally and you don't really understand why at the time, but it does. Yeah. So it's so powerful. Remember being at the, we went to the slaughterhouse in Vienna and mm. you were there too and you were in the, the holding pens and we spent time with the pigs before they went in to be slaughtered and we went into the slaughterhouse to be on the kill floor and what what was your experience like in that holding pen? It was disturbing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was disturbing. You know, I'm sure if I went back now, it'd be more, I think I, I can I can only assume that the more you do that, like the connection just gets stronger and stronger and harder and harder. But initially, because I'd never be, be, bared witness that much before that, it was very disturbing anyway. Yeah. Do you know? And it's just hard. It's hard to hold on to old beliefs when you're in that situation because the reality in front of you is so different to it. Yeah. Do you know? Like, so you're standing there and stuff thinking, like, oh my God, look at these animals getting killed. I used to eat animals. This is crazy. Like, yeah, yeah. Am I a bad guy? Am I good yeah, guy? Yeah. What am I doing? Like, and all those conceptions and beliefs are just getting completely shattered. Mm. And it's undeniable. It's undeniable that when you see that, you know that the animal doesn't want to die. Yeah. It's un you have to be honestly, man. It's like to think anything otherwise is delusional. Yeah, it's delusional. Yeah. For anyone who hasn't seen that video, you were actually in the holding pens and watching the uh, slaughterhouse worker lead yeah. them in through this uh, shoot mm. to come out and be electrically stunned, hung up, and stabbed to death. Mm. But what they were going through is um, a, there was a big flame. Mm. Oh, this yeah, flame yeah, yeah. was um, burning their hair off or something like it's that. Demonic, so, man. so they're going into this. Uh, they'd be uh, hung up, stabbed, drained of their blood dumped in a in a big uh, hot boiling water to to loosen the, their hair and then they're like flame throwed to burn the rest mm. off or something and you could see that flame Dude, coming it was through demonic, the demonic I remember yeah. it's very 
Honestly, man, I think the conception of what it yeah. is and what it actually is is very like yeah. these pigs are getting walked in there and it's all green grass and it's like, nah, dude, it's like it looks like a scene out of horror movie. Flames yeah. going everywhere, yeah. all sorts of torture devices. It's, Some, you know, it's not like the dude coming in to pull the pigs out, smiling like, oh yeah, baby, let me carry you to your death. No, they're getting dragged, squealing. Yeah. The guy looks like he's lost all kind of. Emo- emotion. emotional yep. any form of emotion he had within him has just now been suppressed by something else yep and it's just like it's, it's a just, horror movie what it's it? a horror movie yeah yeah like yeah. i was like this was towards the end of a tour this was actually on my birthday I remember getting mm. up at 4 a.m and uh going to the the slaughterhouse like this was on my birthday it was just a very emotional sad experience and uh to sit there with them for two hours before meeting them watching them interact and mm. then going in there to watch that like you basically experienced something that not many vegans have experienced, you know, and, mm. and uh, you know, a lot of people don't get to see it that close up. And mm. this slaughterhouse owner was priding himself on, you know, the high welfare standard of his pig slaughterhouse. So this, this what we actually saw there was some of the highest standards in the world, like, you know, quick stunning. And it was just, it was still a horror story, wasn't mm. it? You're just killing... How can not killing something not be a horror story? Yeah, 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 of course. Regardless of the method, really. So, um, yeah, you got a, a pretty much a taste of what it's like to, to go on like a hectic tour. Yeah, and we hectic. slept on single beds next to each other, <laughs> going on the same toilet, you know, basically it was, it was charged batteries, get to yeah. sleep, get It was up. good because it was probably the perfect combination, honestly. Who knows how it would have worked out with any, anyone yeah. else. You know, yeah, so it's probably the perfect fit. Like. Yeah, and I was under a lot of stress, and you know, it wasn't like all all smooth sailing. Right, in reflection, honestly, it was pretty smooth. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was. You know what I'm saying? There's like, a few hiccups there. We lost a bank card. Yeah, <laughs> but, hiccups, but honestly, like if you think of those hiccups and the way they yeah. were handled, like yeah. the period between the incident happening and getting resolved yeah. is like, it's not. People, man, haven't you know what I mean? Get cut yeah. off at a red light. They hold that all day. In yeah. a different country, lose your bank card, stress, haven't slept in two weeks and let go of it in 10 minutes. Yeah. It's like, it's pretty good. <laughs> no, it was great. It was good to have you there, man. It was good support. Now, what people don't uh, know is that, um, I think it was the day after the slaughterhouse thing, I had a debate with a guy on LBC radio mm. and he was uh, sort of uh, making a mockery of the pigs going, oh, there are any pigs and people actually criticized my conduct in that debate after that. I think crazy I remember, that t- one, I told remember you said, yeah you sat, sat sat there and filmed that and they were going oh you're too aggressive you you know you're doing veganism a disservice because I vehemently mm. defended the animals and uh you know it, it had been a hard three weeks and we just bore mm. witness at the slaughterhouse like what do you think about like so so if let's just say you you weren't uh, involved in all these bearing witness and mm. seeing what's going on to the animals and then you saw my demeanor uh, demeanor you might have thought oh wow he's a bit Adam, you know, you might have thought oh, it was a bit full on there, but because you'd been on the tour with me and then saw my demeanor in the interview, what did you think of it? You think, oh, that was justified compared to what? what yeah, of course it's justified. Yeah. It's not, it's, it doesn't even get close to what, it's, of course it's justified. Yeah. So, you know, for someone who's, it's just so, it's so irrational to think that, 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 that you have, if you haven't born, like that, if you haven't born witness to it, you don't really know what it's about and you're eating dead animals that you're yeah. going to completely understand what the guy's saying. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? And think that, oh, it's complete. So I think it was completely justified, yeah. man. It sounds harsh. I don't even know how it sounds harsh. You know, because that just becomes reality. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like when you're out there, that's just reality. That's how it is. And to not say it how it is just would be a disjustice to you, to the people suffering, the animal suffering and yourself. Like, yeah. So yeah. It's what needs to be said, man. And, and all you have to do is just go back in history and just replace the scenario with whatever you want. With, with human beings. Injustice, or, yeah. injustice, and someone standing up for injustice. Even reflect on your own personal yeah. life and put yourself in the situation. What yeah. are you going to do? Exactly. Of course, you would do the same thing, man. Makes very, uh, it's very simple for me. I mean, defending animals is very simple for yeah. me. And I'm, I'm grateful that you got a chance to experience all that. And, you know, um, you've actually done everyone proud and you know i know it was just a personal journey for you but really mm. like everyone was uh standing around watching you on the on these uh cycling feats these endurance feats that you won by a large stretch and we were just like oh my god like this guy's you know you've really done you know you've really broken through so many stereotypes that so you're a big vegan you're you know you're muscly vegan and you know then you just hopped on a bike and you're mm. just a crazy ultra endurance athlete as well so you've done um really good things man and um really proud of you and thanks Appreciate so much it. for 
you know, pushing through when you wanted to give up and, <laughs> yeah. you know, being the only vegan on the first, maybe the only vegan on the mm. first ride and, you know, uh, one of two vegans yeah. who won. Well, the guy who came back the next year and did it, he was also a vegan. Oh, uh, wow. Year. And he did, it was, he he ended up setting the quickest time that year too. Epic. So it's, it's become very uh, popular. It's you almost know. like a vegan's got a little bit extra to prove because yeah. <laughs> well, it becomes it's becoming very popular. You get I get a lot of questions people asking about diet and yeah and this and honestly like the diet the diet obviously is a little part of riding like no that. you know what I'm saying. But what what it does show is that it you can be a vegan and do these things. You can eat you a plant based diet and yeah. do these things. So why would, do we have to put animals in slaughterhouses yeah. so you yeah. can you know? Put and the a, mental advantage of just being in full alignment with your best self. Yeah, is the biggest advantage, yeah. man. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. the biggest advantage. But sometimes people approach it thinking like, okay, if I eat broccoli and I eat that, what's going to be like, what's going to give me my muscles more glycogen? Yeah. So don't even worry about that. What's going to make you more of a line as a human being? Yeah. Better within yourself. Better within yourself. And then you will be able to extract that performance out of yourself, you know? And that's really the ticket there with the veganism and just performance in all assets of life, aspects yeah. of life, really. So being aligned. Being fully aligned, you know, and that's the most comfortable state to be in. It's the most energy effective state to be in because you're not yeah. there having these conversations with yourself like, should I do something different? Am I being a good guy? Yeah. You're not a- acting in contradict- a contradiction to your morals. Yeah. And you're feeding, honestly, you are feeding the best part of yourself and it grows. And the more you nurture it by doing good things, you know you're in alignment with and morally, because you have that innate moral intelligence within yourself anyway. Yeah. You know, you, you don't have to go far or reflect on much to know it. If you see someone in pain, you get upset. Yeah. You feel like you hurt your toe when you see someone stub your toe. Yeah. You look at an animal sad, you get sad. Empathy. And you just nurture that and it grows in yourself and it becomes something, life completely changes, which is cool. Abdullah, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. What's next for you quickly before we finish up? So... Um, at the end of the year, I'm going to the 24 hour world championships in okay. America. So What's I'm, that? It's a, the most, it's just, it's on a course. It's the most distance in 24 hours. Okay. So I'm trying to organize that now, yep. uh, in a, you know, which is different for me because usually I just hop on a bike and just say, who cares? Let's who's, go for it. Or let's go for it. But now I'm trying to get a bit of support and things for it, which is a bit more organized, a bit more organized, which is, which is different for me. Um, and then after that, I'll probably go to Europe next year and do across Europe wow. and then I'll probably call it a day. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. After Europe, I'll probably retire. Call. Yeah, because there's other things I want to focus on. You know what awesome. I mean? So I'll just once I do Europe, I'll just hang the bike. I'm not hang the bike up. I'll probably go for a 20 minute ride and just <laughs> train, and that's it. Excellent, mate. Thanks so much for coming on, brother. I appreciate it, man. No worries, bro. Okay. That was sick. Yeah, that was good. That was a good podcast, yeah, man.